Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Architectural League, I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's program. I'm Rosalie Ginevra, the Executive Director of the League, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's event on New Sondo, um, New Sondo City in South Korea and Meishi Lake in China's Hunan province as case studies of how information networks and ubiquitous digital intelligence may affect the design and experience of urban space. Tonight's program is presented in connection with the Architectural League's current exhibition called Toward the Sentient City. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, that's what comes from not um, being able to work on it other than Mac platform, I guess. Um, tonight's, let's see, um, which centers on five projects commissioned by the League to critically explore the relationship between ubiquitous computing and urban space. Several of the projects have physical manifestations in various parts of New York City. All of them are represented in the Hub exhibition, which is currently on view at the Urban Center. And all of them also have very robust lives on the, lives on the World Wide Web, both on the overall website sentientcity.net and on the individual project websites. I invite you to take a look at all of it. There's a great deal there to stimulate your thinking. We have some booklets, I think, on the table outside, um, if you didn't get one in the mail, that describes, um, that will lead you to all the different parts um, of the show and the project. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I'd like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council for support that has helped make the Sentient City project possible. I also want to thank the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the Architectural League, and the Department of Architecture and the Department of Media Study at the University of Buffalo for their support for Towards the Sentient City. Tonight we have the fascinating opportunity to see what happens when building in comprehensive networking capacity for virtually every kind of information that makes a city tick becomes an explicit goal in the design and construction of a new town. The two projects we'll hear about are New Songdo City outside of Seoul and Meishi Lake in Hunan province. Both projects are being developed by Gale International, an American development company, in conjunction with local partners, and both are extremely ambitious in their environmental goals as well as in their efforts to create a seamless interface between the physical world and ambient informatics. Our speakers tonight are Jamie Von Klemperer of Cone Pedersen Fox and Valina Bolchandani of Cisco Systems. Jamie is the partner in charge of KPF's work on the master plans and a significant number of building designs for both New Songdo City and Meishi Lake. And Relina is the director of the Connected Real Estate Practice at Cisco and is implementing the Cisco's Smart Plus Connected Communities vision on these projects. Jamie Von Klemperer's Many projects with Cone Pedersen Fox in the United States, Europe, and Asia have included the Daniel Patrick Moynihan United States Courthouse in New York City, the Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Ambassador's Residence in Nicosia, Cyprus, the Jean Guancan West Tower now under construction in Beijing, and the Dongbu Financial Center in Seoul. Jamie received his bachelor's degree at Harvard and master's degrees in architecture both at Trinity College, Cambridge, and at Princeton University. Relina Bolchandani is a director in the Cisco Internet Business Solutions Group Connected Real Estate Practice. That's a very long title to put on a business card. Um, before joining Cisco, she was senior vice president of strategic projects at Forest City Enterprises and earlier worked with the real estate consulting practice at Ernst & Young. Relina did a dual major in economics and political science as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley and holds a joint MSE in Technology Management from the Wharton School and the School of Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming J.D. Von Klemperer and Rulina Bolchandani. Thank you very much for coming on a uh, playoff night. Uh, the last that uh, this machine worked uh, was scoreless in the third inning. And I, I know we had, there's a big Minnesota contingent over here uh, from KPF in the corner. So uh, if we can keep you updated, we will. 
uh, but there are many other things to talk about tonight. Uh, so let me begin by introducing you to the plan, the design of uh, one of the cities, and then Rolina will talk about some of the applications of digital technologies and solutions, uh, which she has uh, been working on uh, with the Cisco company uh, in recent years. So let's see if this works out. So, so uh, to begin with, with a little perspective, uh, this is a uh, Gustav Kajabot painting. Uh, uh, by the way, he was a collector of Impressionist art. Most of, most, of it, uh, most of what is now the Barnes Collection belonged to this fellow, which is quite interesting, given uh, Orosov's story in the Times this morning. But um, the, the idea of this painting, that a physical network, uh, very recently built when this painting was done in 1877, uh, uh, notably the streets of Haussmann's Paris, uh, put together in this kind of no, no place of an intersection, uh, then layered on top of or, or with a layer of this umbrella world of people who are in their own kind of sphere. This is, a, you know, in a way, this personal device of uh, a technology that may have been invented hundreds of years before, but it was really distributed in the bourgeois late 19th century Paris and London. So this was kind of, in a way, a new technology. And so it's a very interesting commentary on place and placelessness of common space, public realm, and the individual, and sets us up to think about some of the issues that we want to talk about tonight. Our version uh, today, either in the streets of San Francisco, or on the, the, uh, the trains of Tokyo uh, gives us pause to think about these same kinds of relationships. And in this talk, the joint discussion that we're going to have tonight, uh, I want to make sure that, at least from our side, from the KPF uh, side of the equation, uh, as city planners, urban designers, and as architects, that we don't overstate the case that the relationship between the very place specific place-making, place-oriented, physical side of what most of us architects and probably most of you in the audience do every day uh, as compared to or, or uh, complemented by the uh, placeless, ubiquitous uh, digital technologies. It's really a very uh, uh, interesting relationship that is not necessarily a causal relationship in the way that architects think of programs causing uh, physical specifications or organization of program elements in a building or in an urban design problem. And, but this is really the subject that we want to talk about. Is that complementary relationship in some subtle way growing now over time? And, and again, I don't want to overstate our case because in a, these two city projects that we'll show you, which are at least one of them quite real and the other one becoming quite real, uh, there is a uh, sort of sequencing of the development of this relationship. And the first um, of the projects, which by the way, as Rosalie mentioned, is really a three-way collaboration with the, the main driver of the project from our point of view being a developer, uh, the Gale Company, headquartered here in New York, but uh, quite a global company now that transformed themselves into city builders. Uh, and KPF as their master planner and lead architect, and then Cisco Systems as a corporate partner with a kind of international platform now of collaborative assignments uh, where the, the line between marketing and branding and solutions and uh, actual providing of services that are, are necessary and desirable are blurred a little bit, but all three of these entities ride together then in these two cities. Uh, so the first city, uh, talking about placelessness, uh, although it's, it's located on the edge of the, Ch the uh, Yellow Sea, the China Sea, on the western uh, coast of Korea, you could see as it started off, it actually wasn't land. This is landfill. So it was nowhere. Uh, 1,500 acres. And just to give you a clue about, about what, uh, why this place was chosen and what gave uh, the town its reason for being, uh, it is a free economy zone. And so the network, if we begin to think of network in a uh, physical and, and perhaps here also non-physical sense, is a network of airplane routes uh, connected or tethered by bridge to the main Incheon airport. But otherwise, 
an hour and a half away from uh, dozens of Asian cities of population over 5 million people. The process was a network. Uh, it's interesting just to, to give you a, a sense of perspective. The project began in 2001. The master plan was accepted in, uh, by the Incheon government in Korea in about 2004. We began construction then on projects, the first uh, 10 or 15 of which are complete. And the, and the city, for about 65,000 nighttime residents and two or three times as many daytime, uh, is perhaps about one quarter complete. And there's a picture of what it was envisioned to be as we finished our first couple of years of work, of master planning. Now, there is something about the finite tube space, uh, here referring to the old city of Seoul, bound by mountains and walls and gates, which complements uh, a network, a non-physical network. And uh, it also made possible, in our thinking, uh, this kind of principle of integration of parts, here referring to Le Corbusier's uh, great ocean liner uh, uh, image from Towards a New Architecture. But the, the synergies of use, if a town, as a new town, uh, is rarely uh, so diversified in functions, often new towns, as they're built in the last 50 years, will be bedroom towns, government towns, technology towns. But the, the idea about the program that both the government and Gale Company and we all three espoused, and now which works very well with Cisco's program, which you'll see from Relina, is to have every function in the city, which one needs from life to the cradle to the grave, other than industry and agriculture, because they're very hard to put into a small area of uh, an urban uh, zone. Remind me later. Okay. And so here's the sort of armature of the city as we see it. And uh, I want to begin by talking about several networks. The city is a trade city. Uh, so that, that network, which I showed before in airplane routes, is what feeds this building, which we completed about a year ago. It's a convention center with a free span, an arch span of over 500 feet. It's quite a remarkable structure. This is one quarter of its build out. The second phase is beginning shortly. It sort of flips module to module. Uh, here you see uh, about. Uh, 100,000 square foot of column free space, which will grow to 200 and then it's flipped over. But so this is an organ of trade. That's, that's the first network that we, that we have to think about. The next net set of networks are uh, the physical spatial networks, streets, which make the residential neighborhoods, which are, uh, of course, the sort of lifeblood uh, or the, the, um, the staple of the city, the meat and potatoes. And in building up the idea of the fabric, uh, which uh, de novo we, we had to do again from the mud, mud flat uh, starts with blocks, grid dimension, orientation to the sun, uh, then retail in red and block surroundings of street walls, then cut throughs for through block passageways and greenways, then tower locations. So all of this in, in the center of each neighborhood is a school, which you can see right right here. Uh, so all of this comes together into a fabric. And that fabric is a kind of pattern language. Um, one might think of it as a, as a bit of a sort of a pattern uh, technology in a way, because it elicits, it's not sentient, of course, it doesn't react over time, but it does react to the plans of architects, as any zoning code does, if it's intelligent. Uh, you know, one writes the code, and then it's, people play with it, and it works in different ways for different ambitions and different times and so on. Uh, so, the principles of design of that fabric and what we're trying to elicit in human behavior is uh, to get people to walk around in, in, a, in a pedestrian fashion, which is very unusual in the new cities of Seoul, uh, the surrounding edge cities of Pundang and Ilsan. So uh, this actually required a change in the Korean national laws of zoning to allow a street wall to happen in a place of residence. Uh, but that was our ambition. And then the first sort of prototype of a, uh, a building for this residential community building of a fabric with the first mega block, which came from our office. And Brian Gerard, one of the designers, uh, is here tonight. Um, and, the, and the project really uh, met our expectations that uh, it would uh, create a kind of cascading of scale from ground three stories to eight stories to 23 stories to 65 stories. It's a Fibonacci series. 
and that that way, and it's a little hard to judge what it's doing before the other blocks start filling in. But uh, the creation of both the street wall and of internal space, and the quite rich textures, which play off both vertical scales and plan uh, plan areas, uh, make for something which is which is quite unusual then in in its own internal network of space in the Korean housing context, and actually follows the social patterns of the Korean residential to governmental hierarchy of, of operating units. There's something called the Bunsung Way, which is a stairwell, and that goes all the way up eventually to the Dong or the, the, uh, the state. So, so that's reflected in, in the fabric of that housing project. Then in the middle, and I'm, I'm going to give this over in a minute to Relina so she can talk about it, the green space in the middle of each of these neighborhoods is the brain. Uh, is filled with schools. International education, which is the sort of holy grail of every, uh, of every mother in the neighborhood to have their kid go to uh, an Ivy League school prepped in a school like this. And the school is being finished now. These photographs are, are not quite done, but this is another one of our designs. Uh, it's quite a nice uh, collaboration that we've had with the Gale Company to have the first assignment to do the core buildings uh, in the city to define the architectural uh, strategies, and then to have many other architects fill in afterwards. Uh, and that's school, I'll just to flip through, but Relina will talk about the Cisco applications of technology to the educational uh, process and system. Um, this happens to be one of the, the main public space outdoor walls of uh, a name of, of the greats, so it's its own little system of, of names and chiclets of uh, great mathematicians, philosophers, leaders of state, etc. It's a K through 12 school of about 2,000 students, and Milton Academy is the sister school, and the pedagogy of the school is partly taken from Milton. This is the library before it's filled with books. And uh, one more project before we go to the technology side is the park. Uh, center of the city, 100 acres, very much New, uh, New Songdo City's Central Park is it, with New York. Central Park is quite a bit of a reference. And this project is, I would say, a sentient uh, entity. The design, which uh, Rick Hedrick has done for the plant materials, along with Kevin Wegner in our firm, uh, creates a kind of symbiotic relationship between trees and undergrowth so that systematically a zero gardening principle can be pursued. So it's a minimal amount of maintenance of plants given the way they react with each other. And also, there is a self-watering system which is here you see a progress photograph looking down from our, our, uh, one of the towers which we've designed. Uh, but underneath all of this is a system of plastic chamber cube cisterns that uh, then recover all the water from swales uh, that uh, take the runoff from this whole 100 acre area. And then the park has its own water and essentially waters itself. So it is responding to weather conditions. It's, it's taking care of itself. So it's, it's an intelligent design, I would say. Uh, which, by the way, has, has a, a sort of thematic program of mimicking uh, some of the uh, ecosystems of the Korean Peninsula, from the mountains to hills to meadows to ceilings. It's a variety. Of, but you see this, the, the section cut through these uh, cistern and swale and um, uh, geotextile uh, uh, layers, which keep the salt from saline elements from coming up into mix of the plants and the soil. Uh, and these ideas of water uh, conservation and uh, water networks are taken throughout the town. Uh, and you see here just the uh, assumption about some of the savings of water, uh, the, the serious percentage of, of savings, um, for which, along with some other attributes, uh, the Gale Company and their partners, POSCO and KP, have received a ULI award for Green Cities, which was some, a new program. So interesting to see what, what that program grows into someday, but you know, it was a good kind of a, a pat on the back. Uh, the energy network, which we'll talk about uh, a little later, uh, is, a, is very important. We'll talk about that more with regard to Meishi Lake. But uh, the kind of thing one can do only in building a new city, or, or much more easily in a new city, because obviously everything can be uh, figured out at once. And the transportation network, uh, which we'll also talk about, I just want to show you physically and visually, graphically, what this is before we delve into the solutions. Uh, and then a, uh, 
a transportation system which is a series of canals. Here, here show, this shows you a, a cosmetic uh, canal, which in another arm of the city is an actual canal, but uh, for want of a, another rendering. Uh, this shows you a kilometer long of housing and retail, sort of a Haymarket, Faneuil uh, uh, Hall sort of typology stretched out for a kilometer at a time in the city, uh, which our, one of my partners, Doug Hawking, has designed and is now about complete. And then, um, I think to wrap up the Songdo part, uh, Project to be in which Cisco and United Technologies, another corporate partner very actively involved, uh, and Trent Tesh from our office, so Bill Patterson has designed the um, International Plaza Project. And most interesting here, with reference to the energy systems, this is a tri-generation plant super block. And the grid is designed so energy from such a plant can go back into the grid and as part of the project, a sentient building, uh, what was known by the developer as a U-Life building, but was developed so that it can respond actively to sun angles, temperatures, uh, as well as, as use inside the building. Um, it's kind of a uh, little bit of a demonstration Epcot uh, uh, center sort of building to tout the most advanced environmental technologies in architecture. So that gives you a picture of New Songo City and um, Erlina, um, yes. if you could tell us Thank a little you. bit about what you're doing there. Absolutely. Uh, before we actually get into New, new Songdale City, I'm going to take us a step back and talk a little bit about kind of Cisco and our vision and how do we fit into this equation. It's, it's really a privilege to be doing this work with Gail and KPF and uh, changing the way cities are designed, built, and experienced. So when we think of cities and city growth, uh, we think of waves, and you th if you think of the first four waves, we've got water, waste and water, we have transportation, we have energy, we have communications, and we truly believe that the next wave is the network as a platform in terms of con connecting a city. And that, that's kind of our vision of taking broadband and really taking the city to the next level. So you've got your spatial relationships, but what does technology do to that? Uh, and bringing together the physical and the virtual. So that, that is our vision for cities for the future. What I do want to share with you is we have a smart and connected communities and cities idea. And what we believe is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So we've got uh, healthcare and education and transportation. I'm going to give you specific examples of these. But really running on networked information and changing the way the city is experienced from a citizen quality lifestyle, from a city management, from an economic resiliency standpoint. So we have a vision of a, of a sustainable city which I'll share with you, which is an economically resilient city. We, would, uh, we, we expect the city to be socially and culturally vibrant and inclusive, and at the same time have active and engaged citizens. So some of the applications I'm going to talk you through is our way of really engaging citizens in these new cities. It, you know, these cities are different to Rome and London and Delhi, uh, which came together for different reasons, reasons. So we want to build a sense of community and we use technology as a platform to get there. Uh, again, in terms of uh, when we look at smart connected communities from a Cisco perspective, we look at the economic sustainability, the social, and the environmental. So it's not an either or proposition where we really go in and, and, and put in these really cool uh, technology integrated buildings, but we look at the social inclusion. What does broadband do, us, do to a city in terms of being an equalizer as well? Uh, we have a number of tracks, so I'm just kind of level setting here before I get into Songdo. We have a transportation track, we have a real estate track, which we're going to spend a fair amount of time on. We have utility, safety, security, learning, very important at Songdo with the international school, and we have health and government. But I think my goal here is to just show how holistically this sum again is greater than its parts, and it's not solutions within a vertical when you really pull it together is where you have this alive city and your spaces really truly come to life. Um, in terms of Songdo, um, we have Cisco, we have Gale, we have KPF, we talked about this, there are a couple of other partners as well. And from a smart and connected real estate perspective, uh, we're going to talk about Need Tower, which is I think a 67 story tower. Cisco is also taking space in this tower. And we have a number of services around uh, car park management, business centers, energy management, which is actually displayed within the building, so you actually understand en energy consumption. Uh, we have child locator services, etc. And our goal eventually here is, again, to really improve, even from an OPEX 
and a capex perspective, improve how efficient and effective the building can be. Environmental sustainability, you know, clearly make sure that networking the building upfront and early makes an impact. So let's talk about NEAT. This is a view uh, across the park, which Jamie talked about, over to the NEAT tower. And uh, Cisco's planning on taking two floors off this tower. And again here, Cisco is a company we're committed to going into Songdo, taking space, setting up an innovation center where maybe entrepreneurs can come in and showcase solutions, which we eventually roll out to the community. It's a mixed-use property. So we have, uh, you have uh, office, you have, you have hotel, you have residential, and we have solutions based on each product type, whether it's a virtual concierge solution. But I think what's important to really note here is Cisco collaborating with KPF and Gale is really thinking through what is the tenant experience? How do we monetize the tenant experience? How do we, how do we again, partner and make it more than just us coming in as a technology provider? And I think that's really important now, working with the design, working with, with the developer and us bringing in technology and being able to manage the technology, be able to build for it, and really change the tenant experience of the building. Uh, from a learning perspective, we have a smart and connected learning uh, vertical. And again, our goal here, and we're, we're so excited to work on the new Songdo International School because we really want to prototype some of our connected learning solutions of safety and security for campuses, mobility, even, even getting together uh, campuses in the US with campuses in Korea. So we have a lot of ideas here in terms of, and solutions, what we're doing with smart and connected learning. And again, again, the goal here is really to merge living and learning. And it's not an either-or proposition where you have to come to school to study. So we're kind of taking this concept of learning in the school and pushing it out to the home, pushing it out to the open spaces. And, and eventually, again, getting the next generation ready uh, with this. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the international school at Songdo uh, in terms of how we've thought through it. From a real estate perspective, uh, we've gone and we've got our core technologies and our networks in order to be efficient, in order for em energy management. We've got a couple of our products in there. And we've also, our goal here is to really think through the efficiency and productivity in a more holistic manner. So we're putting in virtual offices where if students or teachers are not using those offices, they close down automatically. And that information is transmitted out saying we don't need that energy and maybe we can do something else with that energy. And we've got solutions around uh, EnergyWise as one of our solutions, which essentially tracks the different devices on the network and the ones that are not being used are automatically, that energy is, is released back into the grid as well. And our goal here, again, is really to use the design add technology as a layer to merge the physical and virtual and have learning be in any time, anywhere, any device, just to take this to the next level and be aspirational in terms of how we want uh, teaching of the next century to be. We also, our value proposition at a high level is it's, it's more than just learning, it is a school experience. Uh, the, the aspects of this, and we have solutions around school safety, we have OPEX savings with our uh, total cost of ownership reductions. There's an environmental aspect. We want to teach that early into the school. And there's a product productivity aspect where we have our collaboration tools, and I'm going to talk about one of the tools. But again, our value proposition is not coming in and building a, a state-of-the-art school. We're really bringing all the elements together with our productivity tools, which are with our energy management solutions for, for the school to suddenly become incredibly powerful. I want to share one of the solutions that we're we're talking about for the school, which is telepresence. And telepresence, for those who haven't experienced it, please experience it. It's Cisco's extremely high-end video uh, conferencing. I don't even want to call it video conferencing because it's truly sitting across from the, some, somebody in and having a conversation with them. And we think we can do amazing things with the local school in Songdo and link to schools and universities uh, in other parts of the world we also have, we're talking about a, a program about bringing celebrities into the classroom, uh, working with NASA. So again, we're bridging gaps of, of physical uh, limitations, so to speak, with technology to take learning to the next level. Uh, I'm also going to talk to you briefly about transportation, which is something that uh, we're, we're focusing on extensively in, in uh, Songdo, as well as Meishi, and one application, which is the personal travel assistant. But we have solutions around smart road pricing you want to pay certain tolls, you want to carpool, we've, we've got clear solutions in place here. 
we've got uh, digital, digital transportation hubs with different ways of getting across the city and you kind of choose your way. Um, and of course we have also smart work centers which I'm going to talk about more in Meishi. But again, the entire value proposition here is truly making that time uh, pr 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 productive and also to change the travel experience. Uh, and that's why we've kind of thought through these solutions. I do want to share with you a couple of solutions that we have in place, uh, up and running. We have the connected bus in San Francisco. And a little bit of history here is uh, also how Cisco kind of got into this space is as part of the Clinton Global Initiative, we committed up front uh, with three cities, Seoul, Amsterdam, and um, San Francisco, to really go in and come up with tangible projects that have environmental impacts and engage citizens. And the connected bus is really interesting because in San Francisco you have uh, millennials who don't want to live in the South Bay, who don't want to live in the burbs, but they work at Google and Cisco and HP. And we've got a fully wired Wi-Fi bus which helps them figure out their next node of transportation and carpool uh, to Silicon Valley. The intention is also to roll this out in Seoul, and this is part of our plan. Uh, the other tool that I think is really interesting when we think of the sentient city and sensing and mobility uh, within the city, we have a tool called uh, Personal Travel Assistant, and it's multimodal. You can get on the web and get on and track your routes. You can also use your iPhone. And essentially, it's also got translation. Our goal here is to engage citizens up front and give them choices. You can walk, and there's a, there's a carbon offset. You get green uh, frequent flyer points or rewards, or you can take the bus, or you can drive, and essentially, you start engaging citizens up front uh, and helping them through their daily life with, with mobile solutions. And this is something that's been very popular in Seoul, and we're pushing this down into, into Songdo as well. Uh, we're now going to talk a little bit about Meishi, so I'm going to hand back to you. Jamie. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And before moving uh, to, to uh, China from Korea, um, it, it's, it was interesting to us, one of the very early uh, sort of uh, presentation we made in New York about New Songdo City was at a uh, Urban Land Institute gathering and John Chambers, who is the chairman of Cisco, was there and ha he's had a particular interest in Korea, I think a personal interest, which may go back to uh, a military peace corps or something or other, but he's, uh, he's been a great uh, advocate, I think, for, for making New Songdo City uh, sort of a pilot uh, ground for the exploration and application of, of these ideas. So, it's been, we're, we've been very fortunate uh, as well as the, uh, the Gale Company. Just, uh, for those Are you of you. checking the score? Well, for, for there, we have some interested parties in the audience, so I want to make sure that we're... Uh, and Jamie, to your point, as it relates to China as well, not only are we committed to go into these countries and uh, obviously use our solutions, socialize our solutions, we're really committed to take up space, partner with the key players and, and the iconic players like Gale and KPF and truly make a difference in a smart and a connected manner. And we're doing the same in China as well. We're very committed. We were involved with the Olympics. Uh, we're committed going forward also in a number of projects that we're working on there, and as well as India. And uh, just to flip for a second, there's also brownfield that we're focused on. It's not all greenfield. And I just think this is really interesting because you've got a whiteboard and you can actually go and design it create something iconic. On the brownfield side, you just have to be a little bit, uh, it's a different value proposition. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very yeah, interesting. This project actually is a bit of a ground field. It's just ground, ground field, excuse me. It is uh, two to two in the fourth. But anyway, um, in Meishi Lake, uh, the, the genesis of this project, uh, as, as far as we've seen it uh, uh, happen, uh, has been that the Chinese government, excuse me, Hunan province, as a series of pioneer city uh, projects, which are um, particularly outside of those primary cities of Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Shenzhen, that we know to be the kind of uh, coastal business centers, or close to coast. And so uh, Changsha, which is close to where Mao Zedong was uh, born and uh, grew up, uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the capital of Hunan province, about 80 million people. And this is to be, in a way, their Pudong. It's Pudong is to Shanghai, Meishi would be to Changsha. Because they did, never got around to building their new city. And in, in building their new city, uh, after the, the wave of public policy pronouncements about the environment, it's meant to be a highly environmental um, sort of model city. 
So that we're very fortunate uh, in this kind of um, policy drive, which the government, central government's in, uh, pressing with this project, that we're able to operate uh, under those circumstances. Uh, you can see here in uh, sort of peach color the, uh, the footprint of this town as compared to Manhattan. So it's, it's about as big as Midtown. 300,000 inhabitants at the, at the max. So it's quite a bit bigger than Songdo. And uh, you see the configuration of the plan, uh, which uh, a good 30 or 40 KPF designers have uh, shredded on over the past six months, including Trent, again, who's in the audience, um, to, uh, to advance uh, the project to the government. It was presented uh, in the very beginning of July and accepted by the party secretary of Hunan province, who is even more powerful than the governor. So that was a kind of uh, 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 committing a face to the project. It's very important uh, for the sake of for the fate of the project. You can see here uh, the way uh, a city, which is right across from uh, about 7 million population, Changsha, is oriented around a lake, which is now, by the way, a very polluted river, so very much brownfield. Um, but with some very beautiful, pronounced mountains, a series of eight mountains, uh, which form the southern kind of cordon of the border of this town. And uh, that's kind of a national park or a regional park for recreation, so it's wonderful to have that. So the, the transportation network here, uh, we designed around a lake which we created. Uh, interestingly, Mount uh, drained a lake in the early 50s to create a river to make arable land, which never really worked. Now we're recreating that lake. But the lake is, is for us not just a scenic device. It's uh, a uh, shape-making, network-forming device. For us, the circular geometry, and uh, many new city planners and from uh, uh, Humphrey Repton, maybe, but some of the, some of the, the, the Green Belt British uh, thinkers of course, were enamored of the circular form. We found it to be hyper-efficient in terms of making a kind of a matrix of uh, the arc versus the radius and the number of, of points of contact from work to live and the minimizing of distances seems to be uh, much more efficient uh, to us than the grid. So we're, we're I think, advancing in this city planning practice. The components of this radial arc uh, order matrix are more work in the center and more live in the edge, village and town. And, and that makes for some interesting uh, thinking as we're collaborating on, on the idea of ubiquitous uh, capabilities because uh, there are defined places here. And in the middle of this, uh, thing, there is a uh, tram street. So that's one of the circular cordons that ties together the whole city. And then another cordon is something we call a green river, which is a linear park and a, a water floodplain as well. So we move from the village here. So this is the center of each one of these clusters of about 15,000 people. So it is, it is a, almost like a, a mini suburb, very tight into the town. That is connected by canal. Uh, and again, this is learning a bit from the canal housing, which we've done in Songdo. Uh, in its scale and in its architecture, but a, and a very important prototype for our work there, uh, which terminates then at the lake and intersects the, uh, the tram street. So we're making the proposition that these physical networks, very identifiable rings and lines, are the, the kind of physical order that will help us uh, in, in working together with Cisco or in being uh, the receivers of the kind of layering of applications which will come with their work. Uh, and, and so what is the interface between the place and the placeless? And, and you see here by the place, by the way, the place of the government center in the middle of town. So these are actually, this is the headquarters of our client, the city of Changshan, the province of Hunan. The networks which have been then uh, taken quite a bit further than they were in, in Songdo uh, of the Green River which is about a four mile question mark shaped uh, cordon of green and uh, water, but it is a recreation strip. So adjacent to every neighborhood and adjacent to every work center uh, is this swath of maybe uh, 300 meters, 200 meters. 
So within this, then, uh, and, uh, recreation, uh, sports, jogging, uh, urban agriculture, the uh, average size of the Chinese farm being a quarter acre, it's very convenient that some of the farms that are still there uh, will be maintained. This is actually a little patch of farm zone uh, currently, basically like graves, cabbage, etc. cetera. Um, and various other possibilities of, of working at the stage of the generating ideas about uh, how information can change the way you use a space, how Central Park would be different from, for all of us if we knew where the soccer game was being played or who needed to center forward or the, the sort of programming which you could easily understand if you go back home, even if it's a small incremental step, if technology can feed this to you in a very easy way, uh, the, it becomes used, much more usable. Uh, another network uh, here, I believe this is the, the water network where potable water is used only to drink so that the segregation of clear water, gray water, and brown water is laid into the piping infrastructure of the town. Uh, uh, which we have started in Songville, but that's a sort of a two-dimensional, this is a three-part segregation, so it's much more powerful in terms of savings. And uh, I can't read, and you can't read either what, what this is about, but waste management, Songville has a system, uh, which is now in place, of pneumatic trash, uh, which of course is kind of convenient, because it just sucks the garbage, but the segregation of uh, recyclables is then, um, begins to be automatic. And, and that's a system which we'd like to bring to Meishi Lake. Uh, but that waste also, uh, in a minute we'll, we'll show you uh, some of the, the, the intersections between waste and energy. Uh, the green network, which uh, whether uh, from Boston's uh, Emerald Necklace or other cities uh, that we know, the connectivity of green is, is a very important part of the use of, of open space. Uh, the recreational use, the visual understanding and so the hierarchies of green are being very, very carefully hung off of this strand of the Green River as, uh, as elements uh, along that sort of necklace, uh, our emerald necklace. The aim of the town, which Songdo did achieve, is, is over 40% green space as compared to other developable space. And then the time networks, and this is only a kind of a, a conflation of several graphs of different uses at different times, but we have been studying the way in which 24-hour versus 12, 8, 4-hour types of use of different kinds will shape how we design different parts of the city. And of course, those uh, are very much part of uh, Rulina's, uh, sort of her, the, the palette with which she, her company will paint. There, picture. Uh, the, the energy uh, 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 map, which is, I think, the point where I want to turn this over to you again, uh, is, uh, is, I think, one of the most exciting parts of the city. And of course, that's physical. It's a network, and the electrons might be uh, not quite tangible, but the, the, the grid is, is uh, physical. Uh, unfortunately, Ashok Raiji couldn't be here tonight, but Arab has been working on most of the engineering of this town, as they did in Songo. And so the smart grid, uh, where, first of all, anaerobic digesters, this isn't so much the intelligence of the grid, but the the, the environmental side of the grid, uh, anaerobic digesters are taking that trash or some of that uh, garbage and uh, turning it into energy uh, where the gas is used for energy and the solids are returned to farms. Uh, and those are technologies which are much uh, more prevalent uh, in Korea from our experience than in this country. There are some wonderful uh, giant trash mountains and, and uh, generators that, that are coming from trash. And so some of that technology, as well as uh, other ideas that Arab has, are being brought to this grid. But then the, the smart aspect of the grid um, and how information changes behavior uh, is, I think, a good point. Absolutely. Now to turn it over. Thank you. To uh, when we think of the energy network and the way it's been designed, we have uh, smart, what we call smart utilities and smart grid solutions. And we think of energy usage in one third. So one third is factory, one third is home, one third is office. Uh, from an office perspective, we have uh, solutions in place, such as we have, tool, we have a tool called uh, EnergyWise, which tracks energy usage, has automated demand response. And our goal is to take the energy not in use, potentially put it back into the grid, and down the road even monetize it. So on the building side, we have a number of solutions we've worked on extensively. What we're now trying to do is on the home side, 
So we've got connected home solutions where, again, you're empowering users to make decisions. Uh, I'm going on vacation. Let's pro program. I don't need this energy. Let's give it back to the grid. Let's lower energy costs. Because if we think about our usage today, it's so retroactive. We, at the end of the month, we know what we, what we spent at Con Ed, right? We know our usage compared to last year. What we're trying to do is be a lot more proactive and move the decision making into systems over the network, communicate with the grid, give back that uh, excess energy at, you know, at peak demand time, and also monetize that down the road. And what we're doing at Cisco, we're spending a fair amount of space in the smart grid space, really coming up with the home technologies as well as the uh, building technologies. I spend more time on the building technologies where you have all these disparate systems. You have Johnson's, you have Honeywell, you have uh, Siemens. And we're trying to put them across our product called Mediator to take the building management systems, take the home, uh, take the information technology systems of the building, equalize that over an IP network, and actually monitor, manage, and make decisions to push information back uh, into the grid. And again, our vision here is uh, really to come up with a portal-based concept for, for the home, network every home, and again, have everything from, from a governance perspective, whether you have uh, forms that you need to fill out, whether you want to make decisions on en energy usage, do distance learning from the home, and again, down the road, we also want to do distance uh, healthcare as, as those solutions evolve. But again, here, the concept basically is, again, the network is the platform, we deliver services across the network into physical space and, and again, make that space richer and connected with, uh, through the network. Uh, the next concept I'm going to talk about is some work that again came out of the Clinton Global Initiative and our Connected Urban Development Group, but really interesting work and I personally am very excited about Meishi because I think we can, uh, we, can, we can work on smart work centers and I'm going to talk about that, but really, uh, get away from what we typically think is an urban or a suburban proposition when you think of work. And as we all know, the nature of work is changing. Uh, work is now coming towards the worker versus us showing up in the office every day. Uh, connectivity and collaboration is key to productivity. And we're really rethinking through how, how do we work. And what we're thinking of doing in Meishi and partnering with KPF and Gail is putting in uh, nodes, a number of different smart work centers in different parts of the city. So you're going to have smart work centers in uh, more densely commercial areas. You're going to have smart work centers in residential areas. It's so pe you know, you're going to have an impact from a transportation standpoint here. You're also going to have an impact from a product use standpoint because based on all the studies you've done, we've done, teleworking is not clearly the answer. So we've got kind of a grid of smart work centers that we want to build out. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on it. But again, we're going to have um, them in residential as well as co commercially dense areas. Because we do believe the urban proposition of, of going to a work center that's collaborative and productive and, ha and has all your tools to work uh, is very viable. I'm also going to share with you, uh, th this is another good rendering of how we have a neighborhood center where you have your Starbucks and your dry cleaning, etc. And it might be a nice uh, place also to put in a smart work center with some community aspects to it. And we're going to talk about that also in a minute. But again, we're thinking through how do we really take the space and get flexible also in terms of usage of the space with technology. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, some really successful work we've done with smart work centers in Amsterdam really quickly. And our goal is, again, if you think of Amsterdam, you've got the center of the city, and then you've got the ring around it, which gets fairly congested. So we started with uh, two work centers in, in Almer, which is a suburb of Amsterdam. And if we think through these work centers, they are very much a public-private partnership. So you get municipalities involved. Cisco got involved. You've got IBM and HP to come in and actually have uh, employees come to these work centers. We also work with furniture makers, and I'm going to share with you a few renderings with Steelcase, and we um, also work with Hayward to think through how does flexible workstations work? How do we make these centers truly productive? Uh, we've got conference rooms, and what's, what's really nice in Amsterdam, we've also got daycare and businesses and banking and IT services as well. So this is, this is something that we're definitely putting in Meishi. Uh, in different areas of the city, as I showed you. Here are some renderings in terms of here's our telepresence uh, functionality. Again, the more nodes we have on the network, the more successful uh, this is going to be. And it's very flexible, open, innovative in nature. 
And what we've also added to this, and we're working on, we're releasing it next month, is really taking this to the next level, which is when you, um, when you come out, actually, I skipped a slide here, but our goal is when you actually, uh, we have a reservation tool, which I'm going to talk about, and you can choose what center you go to based on presence. So a bunch of architects would log in and if at your choice and say, I'm at this location. So you could show up at a location to, to co-locate, to collaborate, to have that synergy when, when you're together with people. Uh, the other idea in terms of evolving these work centers is clearly you're coming there to work, but let's make it a broader community platform like I talked about. Uh, you know, as we start thinking through aging well, as we start thinking through maybe education after our smart learning, having tutoring across the world as needed. And, and that's kind of our concepts around this. This is a tool we're currently working on, which, um, which, is, which really helps with mobility and figuring out how do you reserve space and how, which work center do you end up going to. But it's going to be a real-time tool. It's multimodal. You can come out of the subway in New York, and, or actually in Meishi, and decide where essentially you want to go work. And our, our goal here is work again follows the worker, and you're very product, you're productive because of not only the tools, but also the spaces and the rich spaces you, you engage with. Um, I'm going to actually switch gears a little bit because I've talked about vertical solutions at this point. I've talked about transportation things, uh, solutions like personal travel assistance. I've talked about our neat tower with our connected real estate solutions with the, with the network like the building information system. I've talked about our education solutions. I'm now going to take it to more of a horizontal play of bringing together these, these solutions more from an urban horizontal perspective. This is a current uh, prototype that we're doing with San Francisco, which we definitely want to do with Meishi. And it's an interesting model for citizen engagement. This is up and running at www.ecomap.org, urbanecomap.org. And the concept here is you can actually track what's going on in your neighborhood uh, from a transportation, energy, and waste perspective. So we actually have citizens in San Francisco who actually log on and compare the neighborhood, 94109, as I'm picking as a neighborhood, compared to different neighborhoods. So they go in and they actually see what's going on in their neighborhood, how many households, what's the impact. And this, you start influencing change in this way. And you start engaging your citizens as well. So I'm quickly going to run through a, a quick demo of how this works. We have households. We have uh, usage as well. And we have it by different type. You have, you have it by energy. You have it by waste. You have it by transportation. All this information exists in the physical space. Uh, the city government has all this information. But what we're essentially doing is consolidating it into a virtual environment and, again, pushing this knowledge out to people. So from a transportation standpoint, which I'm just moving to, you can tell the emissions by zip code. So we're trying to green cities almost by zip code. You can also tell, um, in this city specifically, how many hybrids you have versus how many SUVs by zip code. You can also see the areas, whether it's South San Francisco, where people tend to drive more, and you actually see the impact as well. Um, and I'm actually going to move into uh, kind of not only comparing neighborhoods, but more importantly, taking action and making a difference from a citizen engagement standpoint. And this is something we really want to do as part of Meishi, as part of the environmental sustainability. We can also um, make changes so by, by effort, by cost, by impact. And you can also choose what you decide to do, whether it's biking to work, whether it's changing your, your uh, light bulbs in your house to be more energy efficient. And eventually, you can go and post it to Facebook and make this public statement. So what we did with the mayor of San Francisco on Earth Day, he actually went out we launched the program, and he decided how many days a week he's going to actually bike to work. And you can also see presence in terms of other like-minded people to learn about uh, composting, learning, learn about other things through them. What, the other thing that this program can do, sorry, I just jumped ahead, is it can help you plan your routes, and it can actually show you your impact. And I think this is extremely powerful going forward as we design, build, and experience cities, is getting citizens involved. Um, I want to actually end with our mantra at Cisco, which is we try and change the way people live, work, play, and learn. We're very aspirational in our thinking. And our hope is to change, you know, start with communities that build cities and states in the world. And not, not just to go and push our technology for technology's sake, but really focus on getting citizens involved, economic growth, 
uh, the sustainability and green urbanization. So we can actually be proud of these cities that we're, we're developing together. So we'll just finish up in the last few minutes. Uh, the sustainability agenda for these projects is embraced by governments. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, incentive or a lot of encouragement uh, in both the Korean case and, and even more so in the Chinese case to, to achieve something that can be measured. Uh, but also, uh, in our particular experience, our client, the Gale Company, uh, and Stan Gale, who was uh, bitten by a green bug sometime halfway through the planning of uh, New Songo City. <clears throat> so uh, there's been a, a huge amount of, uh, of energy, uh, and uh, no pun intended, um, but of uh, support for the, the kind of uh, green initiatives that the engineers, both public city engineers, traffic engineers, power engineers, and, and those with whom we work in making buildings um, are, are, uh, are coming to, I think, to something really significant. The, uh, just some final images of uh, Meishi Lake at this first master planning approval stage, uh, taken in this case from a convention center with that kind of uh, uh, pineapple skin-shaped uh, hall, excuse me, looking back towards the center of town. Um, and the uh, 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 closely packed, zero zoning, dense retail area, uh, which we call the souk. I think the, uh, if, if we're to reflect on how this collaboration is affecting uh, the way we're designing the city, or the city that's to emerge from the design, uh, it's a little early to tell. Uh, because frankly, the collaboration had started as I mentioned at the beginning of Songdo, and I think we're just, you know, getting uh, uh, our momentum going. But there's there's still uh, naturally a tendency for the architect to think of space, mass, form, function, uh, in terms of some kinds of anthropological constants, or at least in, in some kind of historical framework, where we think a good square has a certain visual property, a certain acoustical. Uh, set of characteristics where traffic works in a certain way. Uh, and so, you know, we don't, we're not abandoning, or we haven't found ourselves uh, losing the kinds of uh, interest in the kinds of things that normally preoccupy us uh, when we think uh, outside of this uh, framework of, of uh, the digital, uh, the very aggressive digital approach. At the same time, uh, we have to imagine that the street as it will be designed and built uh, today in, in 50 years, is going to be a little different because the uh, human behavior is changing. And for those of us with kids uh, who are, let's say, teenagers, they, they, they act and associate, and their schedules work in very different ways from, from even those who consider ourselves uh, uh, digerati. I mean, some, some of you probably. But, um, and so, so that, will, that will change the street. And so trying to think how the tram street in Meishi Lake will take advantage of this mobile workspace. Uh, will the facades have a different character? Will the setbacks be different? Will People will be using the city differently. As the first images I showed to start the talk, uh, we all spent probably our, our time looking at a screen in the middle of the sidewalk, bumping into people, thinking maybe there's a place where I could just find, uh, not a telephone booth, but some place where I could just stand aside for a minute. And, um, and also, I think we, we are finding that, uh, as Tony made earlier, that the best uh, sort of uh, collaborator or partner, architectural partner to, to the ubiquitous technology is a very defined space. It's a space that once one has received, been on the receiving end of some kind of information, there's a locus that, to which it can be applied. And uh, so we will try uh, in this partnership uh, to make this city a step and a half past what we've done in New Songo City. As, as Rolina explained to me at the outset of our discussions, sometimes what's revolutionary is not what one thinks of as 20 or 30 years out. It's just what's one or two years away. It's quite believable. 
We've all heard about it, but we haven't actually seen it applied in a consistent manner in a way that, uh, that invades uh, a set of habits or creates a set of habits. And so that's, that's part of the program, is, is to understand behavior, uh, which may end up leveling, for example, some of the social hierarchies of a city. Um, uh, some of the studies done by, by sociologists and, and business people uh, are, are showing us that the way neighborhoods are defined in places that are being shaped is quite different uh, from the, the pre-sort of personal uh, smart device uh, era. So uh, to finish, an image which was very important to our thinking in Meishi Lake, this is a very famous Chinese painting, those of you who know the image of the river, festival along the river in Kaifeng, uh, originally a Song Dynasty painting here, repainted uh, in the Ming Dynasty, more colorful fashion. But uh, the, this, this depiction, or maybe this metaphor, of a linear network, which is very simple, very straightforward, uh, that is, but it is a network, and maybe this is, is a, a, a simple backbone, if you will. Uh, and then all the layers of life that are wound around, up, down, over uh, this, this great river give a full picture of life. So uh, you know, for us, this serves as, as a kind of metaphor of some of the, the very rich possibilities of exploration and then application of, of the placed and the placeless uh, in these projects. So I hope you have some questions um, or you know, provocative statements or something. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you.